Welcome to the Successful Life Podcast, your go-to source for insights and strategies in the HVAC, plumbing, and roofing industries. I'm Corey Barrier, here to guide you through transformative approaches to business and mindset. Each episode will explore unique methods, focusing on identifying and addressing the core challenges in your field. Our goal is to equip you and your team with practical solutions that foster growth and success. So whether you're tuning in for the first time or you're a longtime listener, get ready to dive into a wealth of knowledge and expertise. Let's begin our journey to success together. This is the successful life. It's Corey Barrier, yeah, come learn with me. Take you down the path of our journeys. This is the successful life. It's time to take what you learn, apply it to your life. It's your turn to live a successful life. You are tuning in to the Successful Life Podcast. Three, three, two. Welcome to the Successful Life Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Barrier, and I am here with Sebastian Jimenez. Almost. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you got a good, that was a good effort. That was a good effort. What's Thanks up, for- Sebastian? How are you, man? Oh, good, man. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Yeah, dude. I'm super excited about the conversation. Just if you want to really quickly, just tell everybody a little bit about company and who you are and all that good stuff, and then we'll dive into it. Yes. So um, I'm Sebastian. I'm the founder and CEO of Rilla Voice. That's R-I-L-A Voice. We are the leading speech analytics software for the home improvement industry. What that means for the people listening is that when your technicians or comfort advisors or anybody who's talking to customers in their home, usually they go out, they talk, they record their conversations with their phones or tablets from our mobile app. And then we use AI to automatically transcribe, analyze, and give them feedback to help them improve their sales and to help service managers and sales managers do what we call virtual ride-alongs that are 100 times faster, better, and more productive. Uh, That's essentially who we are. Love it. All right, so I'm sure that you get this question a lot, and I see the value in this. I'm a sales guy. like I totally see the value, but also I could see why there would be, especially in this industry, a lot of pushback. And so my guess is, once you get a company in the process, it probably works itself out. But I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So and so the biggest pushback that we see. So this is a tool, right, that it requires change management within teams every time we implement it. But unlike other softwares, the change management is not about figuring out how to use the technology, right? The technology is actually very simple. It's like one button, bam, record automatically integrated. It's very simple. It, 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 you don't need a lot of training to use this because because it's literally you're just talking, right? And then you're using the product while, while you're talking. The change management is about getting people at, at the different levels, the people in the front lines, the service technicians and the comfort advisors, getting the service managers, getting them um, comfortable with this different way of doing things that we're not going to be recording your conversations. That's the change management. So, so if you look at real, it's like very intense change management at the beginning. Uh, of the process when you're implementing. And then after a few weeks, it just like, just works normally. But the but very intense change management is just getting people around, not even the product, the text, it's just the concept, right? And from the moment that we're selling and to the moment that we're onboarding and like, actually, it, it's all like, what the hell are you doing? Is he going to record my conversations? This is a violation of my human right. <laughs> and so that's the biggest friction to implement something like Rilla. And what we see it takes about a month, right, to really like like go through that storm and then the calm <laughs> after the storm, right? Sure. And so, so, so what we see, so it's from the technician side or or the comfort advisor side, what we see is typically, and we've done this thousands of times now, so so we have like pretty good data. What happens is the top performing technicians and comfort advisors they absolutely hate this. They like hate this with a with like with passion uh, because the product itself is designed like by design. It's designed to capture what it is that the top performers are doing differently and how they talk and what they say specifically when they're mentioning pricing and share all those secrets that make them top performers with the rest of the team. That's what the product does, right? So I can totally understand why they don't like it. I wouldn't like it either. <laughs> if I was like building up my skills and then you want to come in and share, and especially if I'm in a company where we're competing for leads and you're giving the best leads to the top performers and now I have to be sharing my secrets with all these with all these wazoos here who don't know how to sell and I'm the best one. And I don't like that. So they hate it. So that's the top 20%. People in the middle, they're slightly concerned, but they don't hate it as much. And then it's actually the bottom performers and the new people who have no expectations set who embrace this fully very quickly, right? And so what happens is this is almost like a, 
a therapy by exposure kind of thing that happens. Because what we've seen is that the magic number is five. Once you get your people recording five times consecutively, it's just like record five times. They almost like lose the fear entirely. It's this effect in psychology. It's called the Hawthorne effect where they study when they were, when you tape somebody or you video them or you, they know that they're being recorded, they change their behavior because they're very alert. Like their fight or flight is activated. So they're like really alert, but then their brain gets tired because they can't be in fight or flight for like hours and hours. <laughs> and so then the effect dies down after a couple of hours. And then we see the exact same thing. We should, when the first time they're going to record, we've had people be like, I have a heart problem. This is going to kill me. This is going to be my heart rate. <laughs> AI is evil, man. I don't want to have AI in my pocket. This is some crap. <laughs> and so they get really scared. They record five times. And some of those top performers who hate it a lot, like really passionately, they end up becoming some of the top users because they're naturally top performers. They want to improve. <laughs> and they're the people that are going to go back and read their data. And so we literally, it's like oh, so funny. We have like, when we onboard customers, we have a side-by-side of a top performer saying like, this is evil, this is wrong. And then like a month later, you're like, this is the best thing. <laughs> this is not, and nothing changed. It's just that they got rid of that fear because they used it. So typically it takes about a month, five recordings for people to start seeing the differences. And then after the first month, the tool really works. It works really well because people start improving with the, this AI coach that's giving them feedback. When the bottom performers and the new reps start bridging that gap with the top performers and everybody noticed, everybody's like, hey, man, the game just changed. And so you either change with it or you get left behind it. I explained to people like it's like watching the movie Moneyball. It's the exact same concept. Some nerd brings in some data to play the sport that's usually based on charisma and talent or whatever. And then the nerds start beating the hell out of everybody. And everybody's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> what's happening here? <laughs> and then everybody copies what the nerds are doing. So, 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 so it, it takes about a month uh, or so to get around it. So how often, you've been on stages, I'm pretty sure, right? And if I'm not yeah. mistaken, you, your trade was a comedian. Well, actually, I read something about political science as well, which we'll get into that. But I, Political science econ is what I what says on my paper, like, uh, but that's a lie. I never <laughs> went to class. I, I always, I, my, when I went to college, I was just doing stand-up comedy. I, I skipped class. Yeah. So what I was, so how I know that you would probably watch yourself afterwards, which is the most painful thing. It's so painful, but that pain breeds improvement massively. All all the, all my, all of uh, comp, like all of the people that are taking comedy seriously are always recording their sets and reviewing it afterwards to see what they can do better. Cause they're actually what comedians are doing. So, so, so for you to see a comedian that like performs, you know, on, on Madison Square Garden, that comedian has spent a year kind of refining every little thing about that hour of material for 45 minutes, like just like literally testing everything. You have an idea of what's funny, you go out and test it with a crowd. The way I used to do it in comedy is I used to do six shows a day, seven days a week, starting on at 2 p.m. Like imagine the kind of degenerates that go to a comedy show on a 2 p.m. on a Wednesday. <laughs> Greenwich Village. <laughs> you can imagine. It's just like to, to people like not laid off at work. And it's, it's like they stayed over from the night before because their life is in shift. And you're just like sitting there in the crowd and you're just trying to get anything out of them. So you're just like every show, you're just like trying to test like a little thing. It's like, oh, let me test this setup. Let me test the punchline. Let me test the tone, which would like, and everything you're testing it. So if you record it, you can go back, take notes, iterate so that you do it better the next time. So the, the idea for the prelude, one of the preludes, the idea for real, I came actually because I was doing stand-up, but I noticed all the comedians were recording each other and I was recording myself. And yeah, so that was, and I was like, oh, what if we could analyze the laughter, blah, blah, blah. And so, so yeah. That's but, really, that's cool. That's really cool. Dang, I had a thought there. I completely lost it. So it, it'll come <laughs> back. It'll, yeah, it'll come back to me. Well, oh, I know what it was. Do you, are you glad, do you, so a lot of, we don't have to get into politics by any stretch, but at the end of the, the right now, it feels like, this is completely off subject, but it feels like comedy's changed a lot. Oh, yeah. Like, there's a lot of, it's just not as good as it used to be. Attention contractors of the Successful Life podcast. Want to supercharge your business decisions? We've got something just for you. Head over to our website, SuccessfulLifePodcast.com, and click on the free download button to grab your copy of Warning When Hiring a Leadership Coach. Equip yourself with the insights you need to make informed decisions for your business. Don't miss out. Yeah. Well, I I used to think that because I used to watch, like, the funniest things, like, 
my, the funniest special I've watched ever is like uh, Dave Chappelle killing them softly, like <laughs> the early two thousands. There's like a like my favorite joke is like he's like in the in, in in some hood and he like and he sees a baby and he's like in a limo and he's just like scared and he just like lowers the window a little bit and he goes like hey baby go home man <laughs> and the baby's like listen man I'm trying to sell some weed man I got kids to feed <laughs> <laughs> and so no but so I used to think but dude I watched Shane Gillis's new special man. Uh. He's like Shane and Nef, oh my god, dude, that special made me laugh just as much as. So I, I think what's happening now is that the what had happened was like TV got really clean, like and and the, the way comedians got gigs before it's like, oh, you go to the Tonight Show and you you go to like these TV channels. What happened in the last five years, I would say, is that comedians started not just finding about the the other avenues that are out there, but really exploiting them and getting big. Like this is guy, Andrew Schultz. He got really popular on YouTube and he, he's now like super popular. And then the comedian's doing the podcast and stuff, stuff like, so they're like going through all these, you know, it's not even alternative media. It's like just social media, right? And they're not, and, and the, the comics mindset has changed. It's like, they're getting much better at marketing. They're getting much better at distribute distribution themselves, right? So you don't have to rely on keeping their sets like super down the middle. Because that's what you have to do if you want to get into the Tonight Show or whatever it is, because you're just trying to appeal to like everybody. It's not everybody anymore. It's just like what whoever's watching TV, <laughs> whoever's watching TV. I don't know who's watching TV. I don't even have a TV. This is my house. I don't have a TV. So, yeah. <laughs> so whoever's so so now you what I I think it's changing as you see like. I, I think it's changing back to like, it, it, and it always ebbs and flows. So like, if you listen to Quentin Tarantino talking about how movies were so soft in the nineties, because in the nineties, we also had this like big PC crap, like, and he talks about like how he was very irreverent. Right. And he came out with like a whole fiction and reservoir dogs. And it, the people with like, with he, he led the charge of this kind of like counter reformation. movement. Of being, and I think that's what's happening in comedy. And it's really exciting. If you go to like, shows in new york and austin it's like people like are dying to like hear like really good comedy you are not afraid it's it's i think i would say like maybe like in the mid 2010s like it was getting but like Chappelle pushing out his special he doesn't give a crap and i yeah. think comedy, yeah i i think it's, it's changing back that's awesome dude i'm glad to hear that <laughs> yeah i, I don't uh, and then we'll move on from this i it shocks me every time which i love i love listening to the clips on South Park. Like, I don't, I really don't know how in the world they still get away with putting this stuff yeah, 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 like, yeah. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the showrunners, Dre Parker, and I don't remember the other guy's name, but they literally put on, they put like something like a couple of years ago saying like, please cancel South Park. We do yeah. not want to do this show anymore. <laughs> it's been 20 years. <laughs> Somebody cancel South and they keep trying to get canceled and nobody <laughs> Not gonna do it, dude. Not gonna do it. That's hilarious. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So, your primary, you were telling me before the show, you started to tell me, and I said, Well, let's re record. You were talking to me about a different, not HVAC, a different vertical, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Tell me more about that. So, we started in the, when where our product started finding like really big traction was like home remodeling or home improvement, like outside of home services, like roofing and windows and siding and baths and kitchens and stuff like that. And, and we started finding a lot of traction there because people, it's much more oriented for sales, right? Because you're actually selling it's discretionary spending. It's like so home services, it's almost like you're, you're servicing, you're, you're like, if, to be a technician, you literally have to learn the trade and understand how to fix the thing. And then the companies are now pushing you to like be a salesperson, which is a very annoying situation for the technician because they just they got into the trade because they didn't, probably didn't want to talk to people. That's right. <laughs> That's right. To work with the system, and so yeah, so we we found really a lot of good traction there, and then but the markets are are so adjacent, like it's very similar the the way that the sales process works. So then we started like growing a lot in HVAC and plumbing and electrician as well. So do you still work with a lot of roofers? Oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I, we love our roofers, man. Well, they were like the, yes, we just sponsored a conference. Like there was like a UFC fighting ring and the roofers were just like fighting. In the <laughs> now, are you going to be at roof? Come on. Well, is that, I think so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. So I'm pretty good buddies with Hunter. Okay. Nice. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So I should definitely see you there. Are you going to be at, you'll be at Tommy's event too, probably. Yeah. I'm speaking at Tommy's event. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, I'll definitely yeah, see yeah, you yeah. there as well. That's cool. 
Yeah, uh, I'm gonna be talking about AI and how it's how it's being implemented in the like I have this whole thing, this hypothesis, which I think is true that home services or home improvement will be the first industry that will have to apply AI for real business use cases because of a lot of market conditions that are happening. It's like very weird because usually like home services is like laggards in technology okay. adoption okay. happen with the internet, with CRM. But with AI, it's a curvous flip because the people in Silicon Valley have no money to spend. So there's like <laughs> the venture capitalists, just like the private equity people are looking for markets outside of tech to deploy AI, which is happening now. So, and then the first market that they're looking at is like, oh my God, there's a gold mine in people's homes. Like, <laughs> so we need to go after it. So yeah, I have a whole thing about it. Yeah, that, yeah, I agree with you. And that's part of the reason that I was so drawn to AI is because I understand how backdated most yeah. businesses are. Like we're five to 10 years back from like normal businesses. That is correct. And then, and, and if you look at how CRM was adopted, people think of like when you adopted your CRM, CRM is a technology that existed since 1996, right? With Salesforce and Siebel systems, right? And then most HVAC, a lot of HVAC companies don't even have one, right? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Like, and it's like 20 years late, right? And then you look, you think of a website, right? Like when people started getting serious about SEO and like online marketing, it was like what, like late 2000s, right? Like 2007, 2006. Yeah. When people started like putting websites, like you can like, <laughs> like, like that and getting serious about online marketing. So it's like 10 years later, right? Because that started in 1995, right? So, so with AI, what's happening is that we're not going to have in the traits like that 10 year gap to let the techies in Silicon Valley figure it out. Cause it newsflash, the techies don't have money and they're broke. And so they have no, they literally, there's no movement happening to adopt AI for business use cases. So it's coming outside of tech. And so. It's a very exciting, but also very uncomfortable feeling for a lot of people that were used to having that 10-year gap. It'd be like, oh, this is whatever. We'll talk about it later. Talk to me about it in 10 years. You know what I mean? My kids are going to graduate college. <laughs> people that are, that are at least looking at AI, at least they're considering AI yeah. solutions are going to 100% surpass everybody else just that they're that looking not even that are implementing that are yeah. just looking just getting comfortable eon yeah, right. ahead of everybody else it, it happened with every single major technology disruption that works right because not all of them work like look at crypto right like it did. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones that do change society whoever was the early adopt that's why people become early adopters it's very risky but at the same time it, it has outsized rewards right like you think about who were the top players before websites became a thing right like the people who were really good at, at like seo and online marketing versus mailers versus radio and tv and who really adopted that medium first than everybody else they probably completely upended the power law in their market and became the like the default solution and everybody had to get behind. So anytime that happens, whether it's the internet or a CRM or whatever it is, you do see that there's a flip of like the who becomes the new dominant player. And you can actually look at the top companies. Some of the top companies now haven't even been around for more than 10 years, right? And they're like generating hundreds of millions, if not billions in revenue. And it's because they got really good at being the first option that people look at when they're looking for HVAC repair in my area, right? They really devoted resources to being that first option with all the best reviews, right? A call center, right? When it changed, like getting really good at the call center. Like I, I was watching one of your latest episodes here with Jonathan. And what he said is, I completely agree with him that the call center, right, is going to be the position of the CSR is probably not going to exist after two years Dude. because- AI powered call center, right? Whoever implements in the trades an, a an AI powered call center first than everybody else is beating the crap out of everybody. So it's like an AI that's answering your call 24 seven, better than any one of your human CSRs, right? But it's not there yet. It's, it's not there yet. It's not it's there close. yet. It's early stage. It's early stage. It's early, yeah. It's, it's even earlier than a company like Rilla, right? So like, like that's like, Rilla is not even that. Rilla is like analyzing so that you can make the human beings better. This is like replacing the entire human being. Yeah. But like, I, I urge everybody to like, look at this company called Avoca.ai, right? Some of our customers are already using Avoca. This is not just an AI powered call center. This is an AI powered call center specifically targeting the traits. Super early stage company, still in, in beta to like figuring things out. Not related to air, right? No, not, it's not air is more general use case. Air is like, okay, we're just, 
Elvoca is like literally like, hey, we will be the AI powered call center for home services for the trades, right? And they're specifically talking, I was just talking to the founder yesterday, early stage company, right? Some of our customers are already testing them. And like, dude, like this, like just when I hear them talking about the value proposition, again, it's still early figuring out the next, but it's just like SEO is early. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> right. And so, so it's, just, it's still not fully like, like the, like you can't scale it yet, but man, whoever does that first and they can like literally put 10 percentage points of margin back into the business. Cause they don't have, like they literally eliminate a cost entirely because it's a machine. And then you're calling that business. And if that business is in your area in Texas or Dallas, whatever it is, and they're calling that business and that business is answering the phone 24 seven, you have CSRs. They're just like, like it's, that, that business is going to beat the crap out of everybody when they figure it out. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're going to have to connect me with him, by the way, because I'm. I, I, this is uh, I, so it's a long story. And I don't want to get into it, but we got to the MVP stage of analyzing call centers, the customer, the the, the CSR, yeah. and with emojis and whatever. But I'm not a software guy, so yeah. we kind of stopped there. Yeah. So, so I'm super interested to hear about this. Imagine this guy. How do you spell it? Uh, a V O C A dot AI. Okay. So imagine a VOCA when a storm hits. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or roofers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, deploy yeah. 10,000 calls. You will 100% be the first person there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll take it a step further. And here's where our new software is coming in. I, I really didn't set this up to tell you about my software, but I am going to tell you about it now. <laughs> so, and it's not released yet. We are, I can't get into the details, but essentially within 30 seconds, you'll have a roof measurement in your inbox. Yeah. From, yeah, yeah, from, yeah, from an ad or from a door knocker, we're meeting with a development, doesn't matter who it is today. And so that's disrupting these other measurement tools, right? Yep. Because it takes hours sometimes. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Three yep. estimates in your inbox, less than 30 seconds. Right. So imagine a storm hits, not only do you get a phone call, but then you get the estimate in your inbox in 30 seconds. Like that. It's over. Yeah. Right? You yeah. can't compete with that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that yeah, I'm super excited about that. I did not, man, I I really feel like I've learned, I know a lot about AI, but I have not heard about this company. No, no. Uh, again, it's happening very, like these are companies that were became possible like November last year, like you mentioned, right? Like it's, yeah. JGPT came out in November last year. It's been a year. And that's what I want people to understand about this. Like, it's not just that you guys are going to be forced to be the early adopters. If you're in roof. If you're in the trades, you are the early adopters of this technology. I'm sorry, you <laughs> are, because right. people like me who are getting funding from Silicon Valley, they're coming after this industry. And there are early adopters in your industry that are more risk taking, and those are the people that are starting to adopt things like Rilla and things like Avoca, right? Yeah. And when they do adopt it, and when they see success and they figure it out, they're going to start beating the crap out of everybody. So everybody's going to have to. Do so you are the early adopters in this industry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Not only that. So, so that already eliminates a lot of the 10 year gap that you had to like, oh, let, let's just chill. Let's just right. oh, not here. But here's the thing. We're not dealing with the internet. We're not dealing with CRMs. We're not dealing with any other kind of technology that came before. We're dealing with AI. And the biggest difference between AI and all the other technologies is just speed, right? With AI, things don't get better on a year like time span. They get better in a week's time span, days, right? You think about the iPhone when it came out, right? The first iPhone it was like a phone that could call, that could go to the internet, <laughs> right? That that could play music, right? That was the iPhone. And it was like two, three years before we got the really good camera and the app store. So that's like, you could use all the apps and Instagram and Uber and all this. It was like two, three years, right? Right now we have a technology, right? Chat GPT came out like, October, November last year. A few months later, GPT-4 comes out, which is like an order of magnitude improvement. A few months. And a few days or weeks after GPT-4 comes out, people start coming out with AI agents. People start coming out with like real use cases. So the rate of technology development has sped up dramatically, right? So, so when I talk about like, hey, it's still early stage for like an AI powered call center. I'm not talking about a couple of years. <laughs> for it to get to where it needs to get. Talk about a couple of months. Right. For people, because what's happened is AI has also made engineers faster at their job, right? Because engineers are using ChatGPT to code and you literally have engineers that are able to like do a lot of their job by asking this AI agent and they've become 10 times faster at coding. 
So the people who are building it, so, so, so it's almost like this self-fulfilling process is just speed. It's this insane cycle of speed and it's ruthless and it doesn't wait for nobody. It's, it doesn't care about your concerns and your fears. It just moves fast right. and it's moving faster than ever. So like something like Avoca might not be, you know, like completely fully scaled right now, but we're talking maybe December, maybe January <laughs> this year for it to like really pop. So that's what I would caution people. It's like, hey, this is not just like the future. It's, it's like, hey, it's here. It's coming after you. Hide your kids. Hide your wife. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's here. So, so you really need to contend with that, right? A hundred percent, dude. I, so in your opinion, since I haven't heard it, would you rate, how would you rate it compared to the, to like Air AI? Because Air AI, like there's a couple of them out there that are in beta. I was, I've been in beta for a couple of them. Yeah. Yep. And there's like, I'll give you an example. It, one called me and it was like, it was just blurted out something and then it got on track. But that blurting out part is, uh, get, you, you hang the phone up. Like you're not yes. going yes. to listen to that. So right. like, how would you compare it on a scale from one to 10 to the stuff that Air AI puts out as if it's the real thing? And, and I know it is their real thing, but but it just doesn't, doesn't work that way. So, so this is, and this is why, this is why I talk about Avoca versus like Air because it's like service type, right? Like there is tremendous value in focus when you're like like deploying new technologies, especially with AI, because then it's easier to train the data. It's easier to like. A lot of these products are based on the same foundational models. A lot of these AI products are based on the foundational models, large language models that OpenAI came out with, or Facebook, whatever you're using you're not building your own foundational model. If you're a company today, like a little startup trying to build your own foundational model, I think that's a losing battle because you're competing with Google, you're competing with Facebook, competing with the entire world that's trying to build these foundational models. So the value as a startup or as a new product or, or service comes from being able to take these foundational models into the last mile, to like actually apply it to the workflows in the business, real life business use cases, that 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 little thing that you talked about where it blurts out some crap, right? That's the value of the entrepreneurs that are going to take this technology and make it really work, right? So, so then if you understand that, that there's value and focus, a tool like Avoca is going to be specifically focused to target trades people, right? And people in the trades. So it's going to be easier for them and less resource intensive to, to train their models to be able to answer a cancellation call or a repair call, because they're going to know specifically something like Air is trying to tackle like all of the use cases for the call center, whether you're like in a car dealership, whether you're just like a consumer, whether you're in a bank. And so those delivering the last mile for each of those, it's going to be really difficult, right? And there's a reason when, when Amazon started, Jeff Bezos knew that it was going to be the everything store. He knew that was his vision. It's like Amazon is going to be the everything store. You go out, walk in, you're going to be able to buy anything. But he didn't start as the everything store. He started as a bookstore, right? Yeah, because but that was so smart that he started with the data from the bookstore. That's the key, absolutely. right? That's yeah. the key. But, but he did that. Like, if he didn't do that, if he didn't start with the right kind of market, right. it was books. It wasn't a sexy market. Like, it was books. The reason he picked books was very simple. People who order books online. But the internet allows you to have much better selection because it's like unlimited selection because there's no limited inventory. So it's like the internet and it allows you to have convenience, right? But it had a lot of problems back in the day, right? When you were getting started uh, in order to order a book on Amazon, you had to wait, right? For Jeff Bezos to literally take the book and package it and send it through UPS, right? So it would take time, right? And it was clunky and like the whole experience. And so what Jeff Bezos did is he targeted a particular product that could take really large advantages from the natural advantages of the internet, right? So, so he picked books. The main reason was there's like millions of books in circulation right now in the world. There's no other category that has so many SKUs. There's no, there's not 5 million different types of Apple in the world <laughs> of, of like Apple. Or, or like, there's not 5 million different types of like, like shoes. There's more books in circulation than any other kind of product. And so he said, 
selection, right? This is big selection. And then he noticed that the book market, people had a high willingness to wait for the book because they need to need it now, right? And it was repeat purchases because people who buy books, they want to keep buying. So he picked that market because he knew that it was going to be the right market for this particular use case of the internet. Once he got books, then he started doing CDs and DVDs, right? Which was similar to package, right? Because it's very easy to store. They're all the same size, high willingness to wait for it. Very big selections because this is a very big selection of DVDs. So he went, and then after that, he did that. He, then he did toys and then he did clothes, but it, it started with books, right? So, so like when you talk to me about something like air, yes, yeah, very cool, but delivering the last mile, that's when you really see, let's say you, you remember the smartphones, right? It was smartphones before the iPhone, but it wasn't until the iPhone that we really deliver that last mile of like, oh my God, this works. Yeah. And we've seen it, we've seen it happen many times before with, with technology that it sounds really cool. Like it's going to revolutionize everything. And then it fails to deliver the last mile, the actual business use case, the actual value, right? It's not just like an interesting technology, but something like solved a really big problem for me and did it in the right way. Google Glasses, right? They probably, by launching that product in a way that was just general for everybody, anything, anytime, they probably, they probably delayed the development of AR technology by like 10 years, right? Because if they didn't deliver the last mile. So, so that's why... When you're looking at AI tools, I would highly prioritize AI tools that are purpose-built for specific use cases versus something that's just general. Because if you want something that's general, just go and use ChatGPT, right? That's like right. <laughs> that's the most general thing that you can get, that's right. right? So yeah, it's just, it's like the old analogy: like if you had a heart attack, you wouldn't go to your general practitioner. It's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you have a specific problem. You look for a specific solution that can solve it. Yes. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. That makes, yeah, that makes total sense. That is, man, I'm really glad you told me about that company. That's great. Uh, yeah, man. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a great guy. Uh, uh, Tyson is the name of the founder. That's a great, yeah. great, great team. Yeah. I'll definitely bring him on here. And have <laughs> yeah, him. yeah. 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 That's really cool. All right. So I know we're getting close to time. What, what are you seeing? Like, give me an idea of what you're seeing that maybe other people are not because you're so deep in this space. Like oh what? My God. Yeah. Yeah. So like one of the things that I have, I'm very lucky to be able to see is at Rilla, we have like millions of conversations that have been recorded in, in people's homes. And we've analyzed all of these conversations uh, with AI, right? Uh, and in and, and people's homes, like, and, and, and we have a lot of data. We've actually, we did an analysis of like 500,000 sales conversations that happen in homes. And we figured out what it is at the top 1% of performers that are bringing in maybe like four, maybe $5 million of annual revenue to their business every year, maybe more, uh, what it is that they're doing differently, right? Uh, and we analyze how they talk, right? How they talk is like how fast, how much do they talk versus the customer, how many questions do they ask? And we look at how they talk and what they say specifically. Do they talk about financing? Do they talk about giving the company story? When do they talk about it? We analyze all these different things and we came out with like these, we, we have visibility into what it is that the top forms are doing differently. It's crazy. That's uh, wild, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so we're from like these hundreds of thousands of data points. So yeah, I could share some of the insight, but it's really cool stuff. That's like a, like a pot of gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really like a pot of gold. Yeah, it's it's like you're, it's almost like what, it, it, it's like, and, and, and we, we think of sales as a sport at Rilla, where we're like, there's athletes that are trying to get better at, every day. And, and, and every other sport, people look at game film and they try to learn from, and they use Moneyball, right? Like the whole, like a, a, analyzing data to improve. But in sales, it, it's almost like we, we assume that it's just this art, ethereal art, form, and there's no game film, right? So what Rilla does is like, hey, very simply, it's just like, try to bridge the gap with sports. Like, let's actually bring game film. Let's actually bring data. And so like, like, and it's so simple stuff. Like if, if you watch the movie Moneyball, like when they realize that in order to win more baseball games, you have to like increase your on-base percentage. And then that's what allows you to like right. increase the likelihood of winning. So like we found this thing with real, it was so stupid and so simple. But when you look at the data, it becomes so dumb. Like it just becomes so like, oh my God, of course. Like one of the first things we found is that the top performers, top 1% of performers in the country, their talk ratio, they talk 20% less than the average reps, Right. Yep. The, the the average reps are talking 75 to 85% of the time versus the customer. The top performers are talking between 45 and 65% of the time. So it's actually a conversation that's allowing them to build that rapport, to understand the customer's needs. So they're not just trying to sell. They're actually almost like a doctor trying to identify what the actual issues is, what the actual desires. And then the average reps are just going in there and being like, 
Listen, Mrs. Homeowner, I'm going to tell you about our energy efficient HVAC system. It's powered by the sun, but wait, there's more. <laughs> and, they just, and they just sound like a, the goddamn Shamwow guy. And, and so they, they don't build that report. So, and we found a lot of interesting things like that, but just like talk ratio. When you see the data, it just becomes so simple. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, dude, a hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent, dude, a hundred percent. Like active listening is is also part of this, right? So, yeah. so good, dude, so good. Well, Sebastian, where can people find you? Where's the best place for people to find you? And how do people get a hold of you if they want to come and talk yes. to you about Rilla? Yeah, so you can go to rillavoice.com. That's R I L A Voice. Dot com And you can book a demo with one of our highly trained sales consultants who have been trained with the latest in AI technology. And you will see for yourself <laughs> what I can do. Well, dude, I really enjoyed the conversation. I really appreciate you coming on today. Me too, man. This was fun. Let's do it again sometime. Dude, for sure. <laughs> Thank you for tuning into the Successful Life Podcast. We hope today's insights have ignited your passion and provided tools to shape your leadership journey. Remember. Greatness is a journey, not a destination. Continue your pursuit by exploring more resources and insights over at coreybarrier.com. Until next time, keep leading, keep learning, and keep striving for excellence. Stay inspired and see you on the next episode.